Star Wars fandom has an uneasy relationship with the Star Wars prequel movies. For some, they're an insult to the legacy of the beloved original movies. For others, the prequels were what got them hooked on Star Wars in the first place. But to a great many Star Wars fans, the prequels are simply mediocre movies. We can appreciate them for what they added to the Skywalker saga, but that doesn't mean they aren't extremely flawed films. There is one thing on which most Star Wars fans can agree, however. The Clone Wars animated series is top-tier Star Wars content. The long-running series spun gold out of the straw that was the prequels and made this era of the Star Wars timeline a far more fascinating and dramatically rich place. So, now that The Clone Wars has taken its final bow, it's the perfect time to reflect on the legacy of the series and how it managed to redeem the Star Wars prequels. The Star Wars prequels were never going to be able to do true justice to the Clone Wars conflict, given the scope of that conflict and the fact that we only ever see the very beginning and very end of the war in those movies. Execute Order 66. Clone Wars was conceived as a way of fleshing out those missing years between Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, and watching Anakin Skywalker evolve from promising young Jedi to the Dark Lord of the Sith. No! Clone Wars brought a depth of characterization to Anakin that was sometimes lacking in the movies. The troubled Skywalker seen in the Clone Wars is a generally more likable and charismatic hero, with even a dash of Han Solo's roguish charm for good measure. We do know where we're going, don't we? On the flip side, many episodes chronicle the simmering darkness within and the growing divide between Anakin and his Jedi comrades. How is it revenge if you stop this kid and bring him to justice? Nor is Anakin the only prequel character given new life in the Clone Wars. Padme Amidala arguably benefits more than anyone else. The Anakin-Padme romance certainly feels a lot more genuine in the animated series than it does in the films. But beyond her relationship with Anakin, Padme is given more opportunity to stand on her own in the Clone Wars. We learn more about her past on Naboo and see the critical role she played in trying to bring a diplomatic end to the war. And while Obi-Wan Kenobi was never the focal point of the series as often as we would have liked, The Clone Wars certainly helps flesh out this sage Jedi Master. Most critically, we learn Obi-Wan harbored a secret love for Mandalore's Duchess Satine. I've loved you always. And once contemplated a normal life outside the Jedi Order. That early revelation fuels some important storylines for Master Kenobi in later seasons and gives us some idea of how much Obi-Wan sacrificed in his commitment to the Jedi path. Plenty of other supporting characters and villains from the movies are given second life thanks to the Clone Wars. Count Dooku and General Grievous become both more terrifying and more complex. I am the leader of the most powerful droid army the galaxy has ever seen! We see a young Boba Fett take his first steps toward becoming the legend he is in the time of the Empire. Even Jedi, who had little or no dialogue in the prequels, Ki-Adi Mundi, Shakti, even PL, etc., were given personalities and a more significant part to play in the war. Whether you were meant to be on this mission or not, you are now the most important part of it. As much as The Clone Wars did to flesh out the familiar heroes and villains of the movies, the series' real accomplishment is in working with characters like Ahsoka Tano, Asajj Ventress, and Darth Maul. I must have revenge. These are characters who were either brand new to the saga, not necessarily that familiar to casual fans, or previously only had a small contained role in the franchise. All three have become much more integral to the Star Wars franchise thanks to the Clone Wars, to the point where Ahsoka is reportedly making her live action debut in The Mandalorian Season 2. This is the way. This is the way. If an ensemble series like this can even be said to have a single main protagonist, Ahsoka is definitely it. Many fans were understandably wary of the character early on. We were supposed to believe Anakin had a Padawan who's never mentioned in the movies, but Ahsoka's growth is the single most important throughline of the entire series. We see her evolve from impulsive rookie to a student who, in many ways, surpasses her master. Ahsoka does what Anakin failed to do, leave the Jedi and seek her own path before her life was destroyed. She may not have appeared in the prequels, but it's clear by the end of the series that the loss of his friendship with Ahsoka played a pivotal role in Anakin's downfall. Anakin. Good luck. As for Ventress, while she was a major player in the original Gendi Tartakovsky produced Clone Wars series and various expanded universe comics, the Clone Wars series is where she really came into her own as a character. Ventress evolved from ambitious dark side adept to chaotic free agent after being betrayed by Count Dooku. You have failed me for the last time. Similarly, Darth Maul was a very straightforward character in The Phantom Menace, one defined more by his looks and presence than depth of personality. 
But thanks to his unexpected return in the Clone Wars and his ongoing feuds with Obi-Wan and Darth Sidious, Maul became a much more tragic and three-dimensional character. Join me or die. The common theme with all three of these is that they fall outside of the traditional Jedi-Sith dichotomy. Maul and Ventress were nothing more than collateral damage in Sidious' master plan. Meanwhile, Ahsoka became disillusioned with the Jedi after seeing the devastation of their war and discovering how easily her comrades could turn on her. Not only does this add crucial new layers to the Jedi-Sith rivalry in the prequels, but The Clone Wars does something the sequel trilogy never fully managed, illustrating how the path to true enlightenment in the Force requires a balance of light and dark. In particular, the final season adds a new significance to Ahsoka's iconic line in Star Wars Rebels, I am no Jedi. The opening crawl in Revenge of the Sith teases of the Clone Wars, there are heroes on both sides. Unfortunately, that's not an idea the prequel movies were really able to explore. Again, we only see the very beginning and very end of the war in the movies, and the Separatist faction is represented mainly by cruel Sith Lords. The idea that the Confederacy of Independent Systems includes actual heroes and many worlds that just want to live free of Republic rule is barely acknowledged in Episodes 2 and 3. The series makes good on Episode 3's opening crawl tease by actually showing fans what it means for there to be heroes on both sides of the war. There's even an episode called Heroes on Both Sides, which shows Padme and her Separatist counterpart working together to bring a peaceful resolution to the war. One of the most important themes in the Clone Wars is the idea that neither side is truly good or evil. Both are merely pawns in a game orchestrated by an all-powerful Sith Lord to have a predetermined outcome. You cannot stop what is to come. The war is both destructive and pointless. The series both humanizes the many clone troopers who played a part in the war while illustrating that they were only ever disposable tools meant to serve a purpose and to be discarded once they outlived their usefulness. The many story arcs focused on the world of Mandalore also play into these themes, portraying the planet as a place torn between its warrior roots and its democratic present. Over the course of several seasons, Mandalore becomes ground zero in the war and is ultimately among the first worlds occupied by Palpatine's empire. When we last see the battle-ravaged planet, Ahsoka is coming to grips with the fact that her liberating army has instead become an occupying force. For hardcore Star Wars fans, one of the joys of watching The Clone Wars is seeing so many different characters and elements from the expanded universe make their way into official Star Wars canon. For instance, the Republic Commandos had a cameo in Season 3. There were no survivors on Devron while ancient Sith Lord Darth Bane squared off with Yoda in the Season 6 finale. Darth Bane, the ancient Sith Lord you are. Quinlan Voss, a character only mentioned briefly in the prequel movies, plays a big part in the Season 3 episode, The Hunt for Zyro. <laughs> Even the idea of bringing back Darth Maul, a plot point only briefly flirted with in the EU, is adapted and made part of official Star Wars canon. Arise, Maul. Reborn son of Dathomir. And as we already discussed, that seemingly ridiculous plot twist wound up paying off handsomely. Let me go. Let me die. Clone Wars has a way of unifying the entire franchise and making all those previously extraneous bits of story relevant to the main saga. The ancient wars between the Jedi and the Mandalorians chronicled in the Knights of the Old Republic games still impact the present. The Night Sisters of Dathomir become crucial to the conflict between the light and dark sides, even if the series' depiction of those characters is quite a bit different from the classic EU tales. Step into the mist. Even visually, The Clone Wars manages to strike a balance between the sleek, sterile look of the prequel movies and the grungier aesthetic of the classic films. The Clone Wars helps make the franchise feel that much more cohesive. It certainly didn't hurt that George Lucas was so heavily involved in the creation and development of the series. Many of the series' big storylines and characters were either created by Lucas or arose out of meetings between Lucas, writer-producer Dave Filoni, and others. If anything, The Clone Wars proves that Lucas is better served as a supervisor or overseer of the franchise than as the sole creative voice. The YouTube channel Rocket Jump Film School has a great mini-documentary called How Star Wars Was Saved in the Edit. The doc makes a convincing argument that Star Wars didn't become the brilliant work it is until Lucas's team of editors, Richard Chu, Marsha Lucas, and Paul Hirsch, were able to wrangle his raw material into a coherent final product. That's part of why the prequels don't live up to the standards set by the original trilogy. Lucas was in full creative and financial control of the story by that point. 
But ironically, rather than resulting in the best and purest form of Star Wars, the prequels lost that essential collaborative element that made the originals work so well. The Clone Wars is different. It's not the result of any one storyteller's vision. Rather, it's a series that sprung from the mind of Lucas and was molded and shaped by Filoni and his team of writers, directors, and animators. The end result showcases the prequels in the best light, a galaxy full of adventure, intrigue, and heartbreak. Perhaps the prequels themselves never lived up to their promise, but they made the Clone Wars possible, and that counts for a lot. What do you think? Did the Clone Wars improve your opinion of the prequel trilogy? Let me know what you think in the comments. Thanks for watching, and if you'd like to check out more Clone Wars videos, check out our Darth Maul timeline and our Order 66 Supercut. And don't forget to follow and subscribe to IGN wherever you like to watch.